it's the year 1099. On the eastern coast of Spain, the citizens of Valencia endure their third month of misery under siege. The once sprawling green countryside dotted with idyllic apple orchards was now a barren grey wasteland. A dead tree or a burnt out farmhouse, the only thing still standing. The steely army of Yusuf ibn Tashfin crowded around the battered city walls, like hyenas circling a dying lion. The unending war drums meant no peace, and the ebony black soldiers atop their pure white stallions meant no mercy. From those inside, the siege and the suffering that came with it was nothing new. Since the fall of their city to a Christian maverick from the north, the once flourishing state had known nothing but pain. Pain from the south, where Berbers sent from North Africa had come, determined to flush the infidel occupier out. Pain from the west, caught rivals of their lord who dreamt of snatching his prize and reducing him to ruin. But most of all, pain from inside. Taxes had risen to levels never before seen. Food was scarce and disease was rampant. In a final act of mistrust and humiliation, the Muslims of the city had been made to surrender any sharpened tools that could be used in rebellion. Even for the Christian forces loyal to their new sovereign, morale was low. Rumours about the death of the Lord had many wondering what exactly they were dying for. The man had not been seen in days, and his commanders were tight-lipped when questioned about him. Today, though, they were promised a sight. Crowding in the main square, the townsfolk waited, jostling to get a good position. Make way for the Campiador! Make way for El Cid! came a booming voice. The gatehouse creaked open, and flanked by his honor guard came El Cid. Camouflaged in a stream of brilliant reds and yellows, it was hard to get a good look at the man. It seemed the rumors were false. Here he was in the flesh. But if anyone managed to peer past his retinue, past the honor guard crowding him, they would have noticed that he sat on his saddle, perfectly straight, never moving a muscle. In fact, he didn't even blink. The man was dead. At least... That's how the legend goes. You're listening to Anthology of Heroes, the podcast sharing the stories from heroes across the ages, and this is the real story of the Spanish hero, Rodriguez Diaz de Vivar, El Cid. Welcome back to the show. Today's episode will be an interesting one indeed. We've covered all manner of people on this show, but none as strange as El Cid. The memory of this man is a mosaic of legends and myths. Myths that have been set apart, broken, morphed and twisted for all kinds of social reasons over the last 800 years or so since his death. The man remembered as the Campiador, or Master of the Battlefield, has been the toughest individual I've researched so far. In a 12th century poem, he was a pillar of chivalry and all things good. A few hundred years later, when Spain needed a hero, he was a beacon of Christianity, a vanquisher of infidels. Hundreds of years after that, as the old power of Spain crumbled before the new power of the USA, he was revived as a nationalist, the ideal Spaniard. And then, once Technicolor movies became widespread, his memory was pinched by Hollywood and he was recast as a suave, blue-eyed, blonde-haired playboy. But regardless of those who tried to make him into something he wasn't, even once you scrub away the myths, he was a truly fascinating person. And he lived during a pivotal point in history, where behind the drama of his day-to-day life, Spain was changing. The culture, the religion, and the borders were beginning to resemble the Spain we know today. So in this episode, we'll learn about the man behind the mask. We'll explore the role he played in the Reconquista, the so-called re-Christianization of Spain. This episode is technically part two of a three-part series where we journey through the Reconquista from three different perspectives. You can listen to this episode as a standalone episode, there's no issues there, but if you'd like to hear about the light-speed collapse of the Visigothic Kingdom and their climatic last stand in the mountains of Asturias, it might be worth making your way through that episode first. So, let's do it. The Many Faces of El Cid. We ended our last episode with a victory in the Asturian hills during the 8th century. Peleo, the unlikely saviour of the Visigoths, 
had pulled a rabbit out of the hat and beaten back a Muslim raiding force. His victory had secured his tiny kingdom of Asturias, but it had not done much else. The enormous Muslim caliphate still dominated the rest of Spain. Their next few decades were rocky, to say the least. As historian Richard Fletcher states, quote, The kingdom was small and insecure. Its economy was simple, its culture unsophisticated. It was subject to constant harassments from the emirs of Cordoba. However, it survived. End quote. But fast forward 300 years later to the 11th century, and Spain looked different. From their last toehold, Palaio's ancestors crept down from the mountains and saw a very different people to the ones that had driven them out. No longer were they unified under a single ruler, no longer were they led by Arabs, and no longer were they as warlike as they once were. Around 50 years after Palaio's victory, the Umayyad Caliphate, that's the empire that ruled almost all of the Islamic world, had started to fall apart, and they were eventually overthrown by a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad's uncle. In the panic that usually follows revolution, members of the old ruling family bolted away from the old capital, hoping that if they ran far enough, agents of the new regime would lose their trail. In the darkest corners of the Islamic world they hid, but one by one they were all captured and quietly murdered. All of them except one. Setting his sights on the furthest outpost of his empire, one of the princes hopped aboard a boat and ordered a one-way ticket to Andalusia, Spain. This Umayyad prince would bring to Spain decades of administrative and military discipline, stabilising and fortifying his new kingdom. And so this offshoot, this backwater of the Islamic world, was reinvigorated. Attempts by the new Abbasid Caliphate to annex the region were failures, as were invasions from the Franks in the north who thought the troubled land would be easy picking. Slowly, the demographic of the land began to change. Immigration, mainly from North African Berbers, swelled the population. Religion too started to change. Richard Fletcher says that by the year 800, about 8% of the population was Muslim. By the time the year 900 came, it had leapt to 25%. And by the time the new millennia came around in 1000 AD, about 75% of all people on the Spanish mainland were followers of Islam. In the very same way that the Visigothic's embrace of Roman Catholic faith helped the kingdom grow, the same thing happened to the Muslim population. The self-declared Caliphate of Cordoba, Cordoba being the largest and richest city in Spain, flourished. The realm's long periods of peace led to wealthy rulers, which led to low taxes, which led to additional cash for the lower rungs of society. Travellers and merchants from the rest of the Islamic world couldn't believe how loaded everyone was. No longer living paycheck to paycheck, the farmers, laymen and artisans began to experiment with new methods of crop irrigation. This exploded into what's remembered now as the Arab Agricultural Revolution. But it didn't stop there. Literacy rates rose sharply and books became widespread. Their topics were as diverse as could be, from how to correctly graft new olive trees to how to construct a new water wheel for irrigation. Learning was widespread and the population was open to bettering themselves. There's even a short story about a sultan walking past a peasant's shack and noticing how plump and juicy his melons were. So he knocks on the door, pulls up a chair, and just asks the guy for a bit of advice. Raw materials were grown in abundance, and what couldn't be grown was easily traded abroad. And this led to a growing middle class of leather workers, ceramic crafters, silk weavers, and woodcarvers. The caliphate even boasted its own paper mill, the only one in Europe at the time. Scholars from both Christian and Muslim countries flocked to Spain where they would study the language of world commerce, Arabic, at one of its many libraries, one of which supposedly boasted 400,000 books. While Europe was largely illiterate and its population only beginning to find their feet after the fall of the omnipotent Roman Empire, down in Spain, scholars worked day and night translating Chinese, Indian and ancient Greek texts into Arabic, reviving lost knowledge from the classical world. With all this wealth flowing into the cities, the petty kings, known as typhus, remember that word, typhus, spent lavishly on palaces, mosques, swords, trinkets, and court poets. Some of the most jaw-dropping beauties of Spain were built during this period, as the proud typhus kings tried to outdo their neighbours with grandeur. The Great Mosque of Cordoba was constructed during this time, a building so impressive that it led to the city being referred to as the Ornament of the World. While the sprawling palace of Medina al-Zarrah 
dazzled visitors with a light show that seemed almost supernatural. According to a diplomat who saw it firsthand, the ruler had hidden a basin in his reception hall and filled it with liquid mercury with eight small doors made of ivory and ebony. When the sun was at a specific position in the sky, he would delight and terrify his guests by ordering a servant to toggle the doors in quick succession, making it look as if the lightning was shooting across the darkened hall. How does he do? While for evening entertainment, he would gather his most esteemed and highly paid court poets and stage slam poetry competitions, where each man would create rhymes on the spot in rebuttal to the other. Have you ever seen Eminem's Eight Mile? Well, imagine a court of richly dressed Andalusian courtiers going, ooh, when their favourite poet laid down an earth-shattering diss on the other bloke. Honestly, there's not many places in the world from a thousand years ago that I think, damn, that would be a fun place to live. But Andalusia during its golden age? Mwah, take me there. But it wasn't all rap battles and liquid lightning. By the time the 11th century was rolling around, small-scale warfare was becoming more common between the Taifa lords. Through generations of easy living, these guys had become soft and decadent. If someone needed a good poet or calligrapher, they had phone books full of different names, but a good soldier? Well, that was harder to find. So they turned north, to the grizzled Christian communities full of tough mountain men who had clung defiantly to their existence since the overthrow of their kingdom centuries ago. Competition to employ these guys was fierce. Everyone wanted them, and, well, you know, money talks. A small company of soldiers could become rich from gold or land grants. A fiefdom here, a castle here, it was peanuts to the rulers at first, but it began to add up. With their newly found wealth, these backwater communities got a little bolder, and they started raiding independently into the rich lowlands. And with this steady trickle of wealth, Asturias and its little neighbours began to expand. Around the 8th century, one of the Asturian kings wrote to their powerful northern neighbour, to the king of the Franks. This budding friendship led to recognition, which meant this tiny kingdom was acknowledged as a sovereign state by a powerful European monarch. This was something like the equivalent of the United Nations of today recognising a new country. A fantastical story about finding the bones of St. James, that's James as in one of the twelve apostles of Jesus, James, led to an even more fantastical battle where the apostle appeared in the clouds and led a charge against the Moors in which the Christians joined and won. The battle didn't happen, and there was no evidence at all that Jesus' apostle James ever set foot on Spain, but it didn't matter. From this story, the Cathedral of St. James in northwest Spain became a popular pilgrimage route, which it still remains today, now known as the Camino de Santiago, the Walk of St. James. And so with the foot traffic of pilgrims eager to rub the bones of old St. James, this little hermit kingdom of Asturias began to open up and expand more. And they did so at the expense of the bickering Taifa kings, who now barely recognised themselves as part of any unified state. Remember, this place is still technically a caliphate. It's meant to be ruled by a single man. But just like poor old King Ruderick of the Visigoths, he began to feel like his power was now largely ceremonial. His subject's attitude to his authority was anywhere from apathetic appeasement to outright rebellion. And so it was into this strange world of borders shifting like the sands and alliances doing the same that a boy was born into a nondescript Christian village. His name was Rodrigo Diaz. Rodrigo was probably born in the year 1043 AD in the village of Vivar, hence Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar, Rodrigo Diaz of or from Vivar. To help orientate you, Vivar, now called Vivar del Cid, is about 150 kilometers or 93 miles south of Spain's north coast, so, you know, fairly far north. Rodrigo was not born into a poor family, despite what the legends say. We don't know too much about his ancestry, but there's records of his grandfather witnessing a petty king's charter. Likewise, his father seems to have been involved in the legal system in some way. Rodrigo was literate, but we're not sure how literate. Sources state that he enjoyed Bible stories, and interestingly enough, epic stories of Arab legends such as al muhalab though perhaps this says more about the books available than any particular preference of his. Rodrigo's world was stark and rough. Justice was swift and uncomplicated, and death was an everyday occurrence. His village was not too far away from the no-man's land between the Christian and Muslim kingdoms. Life so close to the border could be short, and every man looked out for his own interests first. 
Hence, a boy needed to learn how to ride and fight. Under the strict guidance of his father's servants, he would have learned how to ride a mule and a pony and then finally a horse. Husbandry was essential, and he would have spent many hours in the saddle learning how to calm the animal if it was nervous or how to tame a new, unwieldy stallion. Once he had these basics down pat, he would have learned how to care and treat his weapons, and through hawking and hiking, he would have learned about vantage points, slopes, and dead ground, all skills that he would later contribute to his battlefield sixth sense. At around 14 years old, he was knighted by the prince he served, a guy named Sancho of Castile. Knighting was much less formal than it is today, and with these kingdoms' limited resources, it was probably a quick speech and a pat on the back, but it shows that Rodrigo was in line with the expectations for a teen of his standing. Soon after that, the young boy met his best friend. His wife? No. A lieutenant? No. It was, of course, his horse, Bavieca. In Spanish mythology, Bavieca is almost as famous as Rodrigo himself. There's two legends about how man and horse first bonded. The first says that as the coming-of-age gift, Rodrigo's grandfather let him pick any horse he wanted from his stable of fine Andalusian mares. After passing pen after pen of proud, perfectly groomed stallions, at the end was a scrawny, weak-looking grey pony. But Rodrigo felt kinship with the beast and decided that this was the one for him, to which his grandfather exclaimed, Bavieca, meaning stupid, as in stupid choice. The other story, which you might remember if you played Edge of Empires 2, that says during a sparring session, Rodrigo was challenged to a duel, but did not own a horse. You would face him from horseback, hmm? Here, afoot. I will not allow that. However, if he wishes, I have a horse for Rodrigo in my stable. King Sancho gave him the most prized stallion in his stables, a thoroughbred mare of royal stock called Bavieca. The horse Bavieca comes from the renowned royal stables of Seville. However these two came to be, with his trusty steed underneath him, Rodrigo soon had his first taste of real combat, supporting Sancho in the defense of a Muslim ally who had been attacked by Sancho's uncle. So, to break that down, a Christian lord fighting another Christian lord in support of his Muslim client. Yeah, this mishmash of alliances is something you'll get used to pretty quick, and why the Reconquista is so often oversimplified. Far from the popular narrative that paints Rodrigo as this point of the spear through the heart of Islam, Rodrigo, and most others around him, cared little for the eternal struggle of Crescent versus Cross. The average grunt soldier wasn't dreaming of avenging King Rudrick and reclaiming Spain for the glory of the Christian church. Their lens which they saw the world through was set by local affairs, and the rulers, both Muslim and Christian, made alliances that they believed would advance them, give them more power, more money, or more status. Rodrigo's early adult years were a bit of a blur. There's accounts here and there of him winning duels against Muslim opponents and capturing a few high-profile prisoners who he ransomed back. Whatever he did, though, he made a name for himself. And soon enough, he was promoted to head of the military by his patron, Prince Sancho, who had recently become King Sancho. Rodrigo was a rising star. His reputation was one of a no-nonsense field commander with an eye for detail, leading to his nickname, Campiador, which is usually translated to Battlefield Doctor, but it's probably meant something more like Master of the Battlefield. When Sancho's father died, his land was split between three of his children, and although Sancho inherited a smaller and less wealthy portion, a war predictably started between the brothers. And with Rodrigo Diaz, El Campeador, leading his armies, it was King Sancho who came out on top. One of Rodrigo's biographies says of his performance during the war, quote, In every battle King Sancho fought with King Alfonso, Rodrigo bore the king's royal standard and distinguished himself among the soldiers, and thus bettered himself thereby, end quote. Rodrigo and Sancho, it seemed, were heading for great things, but barely nine months after the conquest of his brother's lands, Sancho was dead. His death was suspicious, and his brother Alfonso, who had been exiled after his defeat, almost definitely had a hand in it. However it happened, King Alfonso quickly swooped in before the dust had settled, taking control of all Sancho's territory. And just like that, Rodrigo went from VIP lounge to general admission. Alfonso couldn't and had no reason to straight up murder the Campiador, but he made sure to keep him at arm's distance. Someone with such talent and such a close connection to his brother that he'd probably just murdered 
well, he'd need to keep an eye on him. And as we'll soon see, Rodrigo, like the horses he trained in his youth, would not be easy to command. But first, a quick message from one of the friends of the show. If you're a fan of movies that are true stories, I've got a new podcast recommendation for you. It's called Based on a True Story, and it is the podcast that compares Hollywood with history. You'll learn from historians, authors, TV and film consultants, and sometimes even the real people the movies are based on as they separate fact from fiction in your favorite movies. Hear how much of the gangster movie Donnie Brasco happened from the real Donnie Brasco himself. Listen to the real history behind Downton Abbey from Lady Carnarvon. Laugh along with the real guys that the comedy movie Tag was based on. Get some extra stories from the production set from the historical consultant on the movie The Alamo. Those are just a few examples. So when you're ready to learn how much of your favorite movie really happened, subscribe to Based on a True Story in your podcast app of choice or find it at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Before we go on, as Alfonso is one of our main characters, I want to try and help you get a feel of the guy. Remember today as Alfonso the Brave, to me, determined seems a more apt title for the guy. Born as the second child of three, it's telling that he managed to convince his father to parcel off the richest parts of his kingdom to him instead of Sancho, the firstborn. But even that wasn't enough. Wanting his brother's share too, he seems to have challenged Sancho to trial and combat, in full view of their troops. With Rodrigo possibly watching from the stands, the duel ended in a clear victory for Sancho. But Alfonso didn't care, and he refused to abide by the agreed result. Then, after their father died, Sancho, with the help of Rodrigo, defeated and exiled him. Once again, he didn't care. That's two attempts at clemency now, and poor old Sancho wouldn't be around for the third. While there's no proof, the sneaky murder of his brother was widely suspected to be the work of Alfonso. According to legend, Rodrigo, with tears in his eyes, forced Alfonso to swear on the cross that he had nothing to do with Sancho's death, which he did. There's a great painting of this scene, which I'll add to the show notes. With the fratricide taken care of, Alfonso splashed out with titles and cash on those who helped him rise to the top. Rodrigo had worked hard to ingratiate himself to his new lord. Despite Alfonso's suspicion, he couldn't help but recognize that the man had a way of getting things done. But another man, who had been more lucky in penetrating the king's inner circle, was a guy called Garcia Ordonez. Ordonez's career trajectory so far had been similar to Rodrigo's. He was probably handy enough with a sword and from a decent, well-off family. He too had been a close confidant of the late King Sancho, though not as close as Rodrigo. After Sancho's suspicious death, it looked like he figured out fast which way the wind was blowing and put his best foot forward with Alfonso. Nicknamed Crooked Mouth by biographers and probably by Rodrigo himself, it's believed that Ordonez either had a slight deformity on the side of his face or that he just whispered many crooked stories that he had concocted into the king's ear. Stories that always seemed to paint Rodrigo in a bad light. If you're picturing Grima Wormtongue from Lord of the Rings, you're on the right track. However he managed it, Ordonez rose to the top of the new king's court and soon he was leading armies for him. Emboldened by the trust placed in him, Ordonez's deeds quickly threatened to eclipse Rodrigo's. The campeador who, in the past, had courtiers hanging on his every word, was old news. People wanted to hear about Garcia Ordonez and his bravery slaying the wicked Moors. This simply would not do. After stomping out any little uprisings from his late brother's supporters, Alfonso cracked his knuckles and prepared for his next challenges. Just south of his lands lay a messy patchwork of little Taifa kingdoms. Many were his vassals already, and they quickly found out that the new lord wanted his protection money paid on time, every time. So two groups of envoys were sent to pick up Alfonso's cash. Rodrigo was sent to the ruler of Seville. Garcia Ordonez was sent to the ruler of Granada. When they set off, what the two men probably didn't understand was that there was some animosity between these Taifas. Somehow, the king of Granada managed to convince Ordonez and his knights to lead his army in an attack on Seville. The battle is really strange, and historians speculate something is fishy, but in the end, Rodrigo agrees to lead the Granadan army in defense of the kingdom. After all, this was what the protection money was being paid for, right? 
So you've got two Christian knights and their armies are fighting against each other in the service of two Muslim kings who are both vassals of one Christian king they all serve. (laughs) Yeah, welcome to 11th century Spain. If you think it sounds complicated, imagine living in it. Anyway, Rodrigo wasn't called the master of the battlefield for nothing and he managed to defeat the Granadans. Everything that had just transpired could have probably been choked up to a bit of a miscommunication if it wasn't for what happened next. Once the dust had cleared on the battlefield, the Campeador realised that he had snagged himself a number of high-profile prisoners, including old crooked mouth Ordonez himself. As they were both knights of the same lord, the respectful thing to do would be to release him. But Rodrigo didn't respect Ordonez, and he wanted him to know it. The bitter memory of being passed over for praise and promotions rankled the Campeador. So, instead of releasing him, he held him captive for days, stole all his belongings and weapons, before finally cutting him loose after a huge ransom payment. As the legend goes, to pour salt on the wound even more, as the man was leaving, Rodrigo called him back and gave his beard a hearty tug, much to the delight of his men, I would imagine. While this grievous humiliation trickled back up to the king, Rodrigo's men were called to alert again by the king of Seville, who claimed now that the king of Toledo, another neighbouring state, was invading his lands. And jeez, talk about unpopular, eh? So Rodrigo gathered his men, and they made short work of what turned out to be just a bunch of bandits. Definitely not a state-sponsored raid. But he didn't stop there. Acting as if he was in fact responding to a full-scale invasion, he scorched the countryside and rounded up a mass of captives to be sent north. Historians can only speculate at this gross overreaction, but one theory goes that Rodrigo's recently married wife, Jimena, had inherited lands further north that were severely lacking in manpower. So perhaps this was Rodrigo's way of securing a labour force to till the fields. Either way, it was a decision he would quickly regret. When King Alfonso heard about this over-the-top attack orchestrated by, well, a knight sent by him who was only meant to be there to collect payment, he was said to be, quote, very gravely displeased, end quote. <laughs> I love this phrasing. It's like your employee has just murdered his way into a shop you own and enslaved the people who work there. And the king's like, yes, that is the most inconsiderate event to occur. Anyway, what's for dinner? <laughs> I'm sure you're already seeing a pattern here, but Rodrigo Diaz was happy to follow orders. But if there was a little side quest along the way, something that might make him a few extra gold coins, well, I mean, why not, eh? Even by this point in his life, he was proving that he was no one's man except his own. The humiliation of his court rival, perhaps King Alfonso could understand, or Doñez would get over it. But destroying farms and enslaving people who made him, the king, money, well, that was too far. Perhaps listening to the sage words of his new advisor, who happened to be Ordoñez's brother, Rodrigo Diaz was sentenced to exile, banished from the realm of Castile forever. Under pain of death, he could never show his face in any of the lands ruled by King Alfonso or his vassals. His family, his property, and all his titles, gone. For all his battlefield prowess, it was his ambition that had led him astray, and it seemed like this was the end of the road for the Campeador. Relegated to a footnote in the annals of history as one of King Alfonso's rebellious bannermen. As the sad clip-clopping of Baviaca's hooves rang out against the empty streets of Castile, It must have seemed like his short story was coming to an end. But Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar was not a man who could be kept down. He had seen from the other side what men could accomplish through cunning and the sweat of their brow. He was only just getting started. The poem of El Cid, or El Cantar de Mio Cid, is one account of Rodrigo's life. Within its faded pages is one of the earliest and, it must be said, most dramatic embellishments of Rodrigo's journey, and it paints a vivid picture of the moment that the heroic Rodrigo is forced to bear the humiliation of exile. Through an anonymous writer from the 11th century, we're told of this heart-rending scene, as the hero of Castile and of Christendom rides his horse slowly through the deserted street. The slow clip-clopping of Barbieca's hooves are the only sounds that can be heard. Eyes full of tears, he looks back on his city, and he hears the wailing of the townsfolk who cry out, quote, What a good vassal, if only he had a good lord, end quote. On the outskirts of the lonely streetscape, he says goodbye to his two daughters and his wife, who he leaves in the care of a friendly priest. The author describes Rodrigo's heartache as so, quote, Weeping bitterly, they parted, 
with such pain as when the fingernail is torn from the flesh, end quote. And then the lone hero of Castile, with a few of his most loyal companions, departs into the great unknown. It's a great story, and in front of a roaring hearth with a few glasses of strong Spanish wine, you can really envision a travelling minstrel lighting up the taverns with tales like this. But in reality, who knows? Rodrigo's wife and his kids may have been left at a monastery, but that's about as far as the story carries. Rodrigo and his merry men instead search around neighbouring kingdoms looking for employment, rapping on the doors of the many petty kingdoms until they finally arrive at the household of the Taifa of Zaragoza. Zaragoza was governed by an incredibly learned man named al Mutaman. A mathematician by heart, he's credited with the discovery of Kever's theorem, an equation concerning triangles within geometry. Though he was the first to discover this theory, it would go virtually unnoticed until it was rediscovered almost 600 years later. I'll put a link to this theory in our show notes if you want to give it a look. Not exactly the most riveting stuff, but the point is al Mutaman needed someone to handle his military while he you know, calculated triangles. So when a group of scruffy-looking Christians arrived on his doorstep, well, you could say it was a match made in heaven. al Mutaman grew to trust Rodrigo very quickly, and Rodrigo, who was now flush with cash from his scholarly lord, was only too happy to keep bringing in the victories. Having no trouble forgetting any old allegiances, he fought anyone and everyone that threatened Zaragoza, including a man he knew from King Alfonso's court. This man's name was Count Berenger, who, if you played the Age of Empires 2 game once again as a kid, would remember him as the bad guy from the El Cid campaign. Time and time again, Rodrigo is victorious against the enemies of al Mutaman, and the victories bring prestige to the Taifa of Zaragoza. Rodrigo was an out-of-the-box military thinker for sure. Making use of all the minds in the room, he would give the briefing of a situation that they were in, and then probe his commanders for their ideas. Once everyone had given their input, they would discuss them one by one, taking the best bits from each idea and combining them into a cohesive plan which all military commanders felt they contributed to, something similar to what we would maybe today call brainstorming. He was also keen to try and get in the heads of his enemies. If his men came down the hill from this angle at this time, how would it make the defending soldier feel? When would they be mentally the most fragile? Count Berenger who, like Odonez, worked King Alfonso to keep him at odds with Rodrigo, was the first to fill the force of the Campeador. In a very similar capture to Odonez a few years back, the Count fell to him in battle. A few weeks later, he trudged back to the King's court, his pockets much lighter, but hey, at least he didn't get his beard pulled, right? Through these victories, he enriched not just himself, but his men. Followers who had stuck with him through exile were rewarded in tow. Muslims, Christians, he didn't really care. A good soldier was hard to find, a good commander more so. What care did he have who they worshipped in their own private time? With his prestige rising high again, he became known within the Muslim realms as Sayyid, a term meaning Lord in Arabic. Originally it was used for Muslims who could trace their bloodline back to Muhammad, but in the case of Rodrigo it was honorific. Though the Islamic sources never mention this, our best guess is that his Moorish soldiers referred to him with this title, Sayyid which caught on with his Christian soldiers, which there it was corrupted into Cid, which leaves us with... El Cid Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar, Campeador. The Lord Rodrigo Diaz of the village of Vivar, master of the battlefield. Quite a title. Some historians believe that this title came later, and there is debate about whether Rodrigo was ever referred to as El Cid during his lifetime. Unlike his other nickname, Campeador, which we know from his own signature, was a title he used at least once. And just like that, a Spanish legend was born. And on that note, sadly, is where I leave you today. But fear not, the story of El Cid is only just getting started, and we'll be back in two weeks as the man becomes the legend. This is the Anthology of Heroes podcast. As always, I'm your host, Elliot Gates. Thanks for listening, and take care. A big thank you to the show's Patreons, 
Luke, Malcolm, Tom, and Claudia. A lot of people don't realize it, but this is a one-man show, so there's quite a bit of time that goes into producing it. I love sharing these stories, and it means a ton knowing that there's a people out there who are really enjoying them. You guys help me keep the costs down for things like web hosting, sound libraries, books, and stuff like that. If you're not a patron already, we've got some cool rewards up, like having the option to read out some quotes I use in the show. If you want to have a look, tap the link in our bio.